Welcome to the Canadian Beef Cattle Podcast, presented by the Beef Cattle Research Council. The most popular content from beefresearch.ca, available on the go. With the holidays just around the corner, the Canadian Beef Cattle Podcast will be taking a break from producing episodes, with new episodes returning January 7th, 2025. Happy Holidays! This episode features the BCRC Science Director, Dr. Reynold Bergen. Hi there, I'm Reynold. This research on the record article originally appeared in the December 2024 issue of Canadian Cattlemen Magazine. Um, It's been reposted on the beefresearch.ca site with the publisher's permission. And today we're talking about big cows and big questions. A couple of months ago, we talked about how genetic selection for growth rate and carcass merit has resulted in heavier beef carcasses with better marbling scores. And of course, the only way these new genetics get to the, the feeder and the packer is through the bulls that cow-calf producers buy from, from seed stock producers. But of course, those new genetics also leave their fingerprints on your cow herd as they pass through. And if you retain your own replacement heifers, then 87.5% of the genetics in your current cow herd are a result of the last three generations of, of herd bulls that you've introduced. So, you know, the same genes that make feeder cattle grow faster and larger are also turning your replacement heifers into bigger cows. CANFAX data shows that cow carcass weights have increased over time. Looks like cows actually weighed around 945 pounds back in 1960, but but carcass weights have increased by an average of 4.3 pounds per year since then. And when you uh, when you adjust for for dressing percentage, today's carcass weight suggests that today's cows are averaging around 1450 pounds now. And that's a 53% increase. So cows are 50% bigger now than they were in 1960. And Canadian Breed Association genetic trends for mature weight are pointing in the same direction. So, you know, that confirms that it's genetic change that's contributing to this. And if you look at the online version of this article, we've got a bunch of graphs that, that illustrate all that. Now, you may not have noticed your own cows gradually getting larger unless you measure and track cow weights or or if you... If you only notice the the size of the cull cow check, but don't look at the sale weights, but chances are your cows have gotten bigger too. Uh, and the big question is whether whether big cows are actually a problem. You know, some will contend that smaller cows are more efficient. You know, they le- need less feed, so the same number of acres can pasture more cows. And smaller cows generally wean calves that are a higher percentage of the dam's body weight. You know, but in contrast, large cows will need more feed. They'll need more pasture and they'll wean calves that are smaller relative to their size. So let's take each of those in turn. In terms of feed requirements, larger cows certainly need more fuel to maintain their body weight and body condition score than than smaller cows do. But it's not a one-to-one, ba- uh, uh, but it's not a one-to-one increase. On a pound-for-pound body weight basis, larger animals need proportionally less energy to maintain themselves than smaller animals do. So while today's cows might weigh 53% more than the 1960 model, they only need 38% more feed energy. So at the end of the day, the same feed and land resources that supported 100 cows in 1960 might support about 73 cows today. But the animal unit month that that is still used to to determine pasture stocking rates and carrying capacity, those are still based on a 1,000-pound animal. So if your cows have gotten bigger, but you're still pasturing the same number of cows on the same number of acres you might be nutritionally shortchanging them and they might be unable to maintain body condition. They may be rebreeding later or maybe not at all and they might be dropping out of the herd sooner. Now, something similar happens with with weaning weights. You know, larger cows do raise larger calves, but a 50% bigger cow doesn't mean a 50% heavier calf at weaning. If you still had a 945-pound cow that was weaning a 410-pound calf, so she's weaning 43% of her weight, 
And that calf was selling for, at $4.60 per pound at, at today's prices. You know, their calf crop would generate around $8,000 more revenue than 73 of today's larger cows that are weaning 630 pound calves, which again is 43% of dam weight and selling at $3.90 per pound. So taking a bit of a price slide into, into account there. And on the larger cows would have to wean 660 pound calves. So 46% of their weight to gross the same income as the smaller cows. But if genetics, a late calving season, or poor pasture conditions meant that those 73 big cows only weaned 477 pound calves, they would gross $25,000 less than 100 pound or 100 smaller cows. So are smaller cows better? Well, cows that wean a high percentage of their body weight, which smaller cows usually do, aren't necessarily more efficient. For one thing, they're probably producing more milk and that significantly increases their feed requirements and it makes it more difficult for them to maintain their body condition, maintain a 365 day calving interval or rebreed at all and and then stay in the herd long enough to pay for their development costs. So yesterday's smaller cows, those 945 pound cows back in 1960, they didn't guarantee reproductive success either. You know, a couple of months ago, the the legendary Eugene Jansen gave me a couple of papers that he'd written 40 years ago, and they're both linked in the online version of this article if you want to read them. Um, but back in the fall of 1975, he looked at 166 herds across Western Canada, and pregnancy rates then averaged 86%, and they ranged from below 60% to over 95%. And then in a in a smaller study of 15 herds just around Vagerville, Alberta, in the year before, he'd found pregnancy rates that averaged 70%. You know, so not surprisingly, the herds that that reported higher pregnancy rates, like 81, 92% pregnancy, they had much better nutritional management than the herds with with 38 to 66% pregnancy rates. So the important point there is that that Pasture and, and feed management need to meet the cow's nutritional requirements, regardless of how big they are. And the most recent Canadian cow-calf survey reported that pregnancy rates averaged um, just over 92% in Alberta and close to 93% nationally in the fall of 2002. And so that suggests that most producers um, and the, the feed and forage manage, management practices they use are, are actually keeping pace with the nutritional demands of today's larger cows. You know, so the bottom line is that the big cows aren't necessarily bad, but they might not work for everyone. You know, if your cows are weaning healthy, good-sized calves, they're maintaining a 365-day calving interval, and they're staying in the herd long enough to make a profit, well, they're probably the right size for your operation and management style. But if they're coming back open before they've managed to pay for themselves, they might be too big for your operations, resources, and management style to support. So what does this mean to you? Well, identifying the ideal cow for your operation and the bull buying decisions that'll help you get there or stay there really starts with good records. You know, good records are key to good management and culling decisions. Buying bulls can be complicated. All those numbers and EPDs and ratios and indexes, you know, they lead some producers to throw up their hands and, and rely on their eyeballs. And, and looks are important. You know, things like frame and capacity, confirmation and udder, those are important, but, but they only tell you so much. Cows wear their efficiency genes on the inside. And the BCRC has developed a genetic record keeping course that can help simplify and demystify the process of, of buying breeding stock. And you can learn more about that at beefresearch.ca slash blog slash courses. Well, I'd like to wish you and yours a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from all of us at the BCRC. And I'll talk to you again next time. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. You can find all relevant links and information at beefresearch.ca or in the show notes. 
The Beef Cattle Research Council is funded by the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and strives for excellence in the production of Canadian beef, cattle and forage through research, innovation and extension. Tune in every Tuesday as the Canadian Beef Cattle Podcast delivers straightforward insights, expert information and a wealth of practical knowledge for Canadian beef producers. Subscribe now.